Naphos, King Darius received tidings of the taking and burning of Sardis by the Athenians and Ionians, and at the same time he learned that the author of the League, the man by whom the whole matter had been planned and contrived, was Aristagoras the Milesian. It said that he no sooner understood what had happened than laying aside all thought concerning the Ionians, who would, he was sure, pay dear for their rebellion, he asked who the Athenians were, and being informed, called for his bow, and placing an arrow on the string, shot upward into the sky, saying as he let fly the shaft, Grant me Zeus to revenge myself on the Athenians. After this speech he bade one of his servants every day, when his dinner was spread three times, repeat these words to him, Master, remember the Athenians. Then he summoned into his presence Histiaeus of Miletus, whom he had kept at his court for so long a time, and on his appearance addressed him thus, I am told, O Histiaeus, that thy lieutenant, to whom thou hast given Miletus in charge, has raised a rebellion against me. He has brought men from the other continent to contend with me, and prevailing on the Ionians, whose conduct I shall know how to recompense, to join with this force, he has robbed me of Sardis. Is this as it should be, thinkest thou, or can it have been done without thy knowledge and advice? Beware, lest it be found hereafter that the blame of these acts is thine." Histiaeus answered, What words are these, O king, to which thou hast given utterance? I advise aught from which unpleasantness of any kind, little or great, should come to thee. What could I gain by so doing, or what is there that I lack now? Have I not all that thou hast, and am I not thought worthy to partake all thy counsels? If my lieutenant has indeed done as thou sayest, be sure he has done it all of his own head. For my part I don't think it can really be that the Milesians and my lieutenant have raised a rebellion against thee, but if they have indeed committed aught to thy hurt, and the tidings are true which have come to thee, judge thou how ill-advised thou wert to remove me from the sea-coast. The Ionians, it seems, have waited till I was no longer in sight, and then sought to execute that which they long ago desired, whereas if I had been there not a single city would have stirred. Suffer me then to hasten at my best speed to Ionia, that I may place matters there upon their former footing, and deliver up to thee the deputy of Miletus who has caused all the troubles. Having managed this business to thy heart's content, I swear by all the gods of thy royal house I will not put off the clothes in which I reach Ionia till I have made Sardinia, the biggest island in the world, thy tributary. Histiaeus spoke thus, wishing to deceive the king, and Darius, persuaded by his words, let him go, only bidding him be sure to do as he had promised, and afterwards come back to Susa. In the meantime, while the tidings of the burning of Sardis were reaching the king, and Darius was shooting the arrow and having the conference with Histiaeus, and the latter, by permission of Darius, was hastening down to the sea, in Cyprus the following events took place. Tidings came to Onesilus the Salaminian, who was still besieging Amethus, that a certain Artibius, a Persian, was looking for to arrive in Cyprus with a great Persian armament. So Onesilus, when the news reached him, sent off heralds to all parts of Ionia, and besought the Ionians to give him aid. After brief deliberation, these last in full force passed over into the island, and the Persians about the same time crossed in their ships from Cilicia, and proceeded by land to attack Salamis while the Phoenicians, with the fleet, sailed round the promontory which goes by the name of the Keys of Cyprus. In this posture of affairs, the princes of Cyprus called together the captains of the Ionians, and thus addressed them. Men of Ionia, we Cyprians leave it to you to choose whether you will fight with the Persians or with the Phoenicians. If it be your pleasure to try your strength on land against the Persians, come on shore at once, and array yourselves for the battle. We will then embark aboard your ships and engage the Phoenicians by sea. 
If, on the other hand, ye prefer to encounter the Phoenicians, let that be your task. Only be sure, whichever part you choose, to acquit yourself so that Ionia and Cyprus, so far as depends on you, may preserve their freedom. The Ionians made answer, The commonwealth of Ionia sent us here to guard the sea, not to make over our ships to you and engage with the Persians on shore. We will therefore keep the post which has been assigned to us and seek therein to be of some service. To you, remembering what you suffered when you were the slaves of the Medes, behave like brave warriors. Such was the reply of the Ionians. Not long afterwards, the Persians advanced into the plain before Salamis, and the Cyprian kings ranged their troops in order of battle against them, placing them so that while the rest of the Cyprians were drawn up against the auxiliaries of the enemy, the choicest troops of the Salaminians and the Solians were set to oppose the Persians. At the same time, Onesilus of his own accord took post opposite to Artibius, the Persian general. Now Artibius rode a horse which had been trained to rear up against a foot soldier. Onesilus, informed of this, called to him his shield-bearer, who was a Carian by nation, a man well skilled in war and of daring courage, and thus addressed him. I hear, he said, that the horse which Artibius rides rears up and attacks with his forelegs and teeth the man against whom his rider urges him. Consider quickly, therefore, and tell me which wilt thou undertake to encounter, the steed or the rider? Then the squire answered him, Both, my liege, or either, am I ready to undertake, and there is nothing that I will shrink from at thy bidding. But I'll tell thee what seems to me to make most for thy interests. As thou art a prince and a general, I think thou shouldst engage with one who is himself both a prince and also a general. For then, if thou slayest thine adversary, it will redound to thine honour. And if he slays thee, which may heaven forfend, yet to fall by the hand of a worthy foe makes death lose half its horror. To us, thy followers, leave his war horse and his retinue. And have thou no fear of the horse's tricks. I warrant that this is the last time he will stand up against any one. Thus spake the Carian, and shortly after the two hosts joined battle both by sea and land. And here it chanced that by sea the Ionians, who that day fought as they have never done either before or since, defeated the Phoenicians, the Samians especially distinguishing themselves. Meanwhile the combat had begun on land, and the two armies were engaged in a sharp struggle when thus it fell out in the matter of the generals. Artibius, astride upon his horse, charged down upon Onesilus, who, as he had agreed with his shield-bearer, aimed his blow at the rider. The horse reared and placed his forefeet upon the shield of Onesilus, when the carrion cut at him with a reaping hook and severed the two legs from the body. The horse fell upon the spot, and Artibius, the Persian general, with him. In the thick of the fight, Stesanor, tyrant of Curium, who commanded no inconsiderable body of troops, went over with them to the enemy. On this desertion of the Curians, Argive colonists, if report says true, forthwith the war chariots of the Salaminians followed the example set them and went over likewise, whereupon victory declared in favour of the Persians and the army of the Cyprians being routed, vast numbers were slain, and among them Onesilus, the son of Cursus, who was the author of the revolt, and Aristocyprus, king of the Solians. This Aristocyprus was son of Philocyprus, whom Solon the Athenian, when he visited Cyprus, praised in his poems beyond all other sovereigns. The Amethusians, because Onesilus had laid siege to their town, cut the head off his corpse and took it with them to Amethus, where it was set up over the gates. Here it hung till it became hollow, whereupon a swarm of bees took possession of it and filled it with a honeycomb. On seeing this, the Amethusians consulted the oracle and were commanded to take down the head and bury it, and thenceforth to regard Onesilus as a hero and offer sacrifice to him year by year, so that it would go the better with them. To this day the Amethusians do as they were then bidden. 
As for the Ionians who had gained the sea fight, when they found that the affairs of Onesilus were utterly lost and ruined, and that siege was laid to all the cities of Cyprus excepting Salamis, which the inhabitants had surrendered to Gorgas, the former king, forthwith they left Cyprus and sailed away home. Of the cities which were besieged, solely held out the longest, the Persians took it by undermining the wall in the fifth month from the beginning of the siege. Thus, after enjoying a year of freedom, the Cyprians were enslaved for a second time. Meanwhile, Dorises, who was married to one of the daughters of Darius, together with Hemias, Otanes, and other Persian captains who were likewise married to daughters of the king, after pursuing the Ionians who had fought at Sardis, defeating them and driving them to their ships, divided their efforts against the different cities and proceeded in succession to take and sack each one of them. Dorises attacked the towns upon the Hellespont and took in as many days the five cities of Dardanus, Abydus, Pericote, Lampsicus, and Pisus. From Pisus he marched against Parium, but on his way receiving intelligence that the Carians had made common cause with the Ionians and thrown off the Persian yoke, he turned round and, leaving the Hellespont, marched away towards Caria. The Carians, by some chance, got information of this movement before Dorises arrived, and drew together their strength to a place called the White Columns, which is on the river Arisias, a stream running from the Idrian country and emptying itself into the Maianda. Here, when they were met, many plans were put forth, but the best, in my judgment, was that of Pixodarus, the son of Morsulus, a Kindian, who was married to a daughter of Cyanethis, the Cilician king. His advice was that the Carians should cross the Maianda and fight with the river at their back, that so all chance of flight being cut off they might be forced to stand their ground and have their natural courage raised to a still higher pitch. His opinion, however, didn't prevail. It was thought best to make the enemy have the Maianda behind them, that so if they were defeated in the battle and put to flight they might have no retreat open but be driven headlong into the river. The Persians soon afterwards approached, and crossing the Maianda engaged the Carians upon the banks of the Odysseus, where for a long time the battle was stoutly contested, but at last the Carians were defeated, being overpowered by numbers. On the side of the Persians there fell two thousand, while the Carians hadn't fewer than ten thousand slain. Such as escaped from the field of battle collected together at Labranda in the vast precinct of Zeus Stratius, a deity worshipped only by the Carians, and in the sacred grove of plane trees. Here they deliberated as to the best means of saving themselves, doubting whether they would fare better if they gave themselves up to the Persians or if they abandoned Asia forever. As they were debating these matters, a body of Miletians and allies came to their assistance whereupon the Carians, dismissing their former thoughts, prepared themselves afresh for war, and on the approach of the Persians gave them battle a second time. They were defeated, however, with still greater loss than before, and while all the troops engaged suffered severely, the blow fell with most force on the Milesians. The Carians, some while after, repaired their ill fortune in another action. Understanding that the Persians were about to attack their cities, they laid an ambush for them on the road which leads to Pedassus. The Persians who were making a night march fell into the trap, and the whole army was destroyed, together with the generals Dorisis, Amorges, and Sisamachis. Merses too, the son of Gyges, was killed at the same time. The leader of the ambush was Heraclides, the son of Ibanolis, a man of Mylassa. Such was the way in which these Persians perished. The Carians, some while after, repaired their ill fortune in another action. Understanding that the Persians were about to attack their cities, they laid an ambush for them on the road which leads to Pedassus. The Persians who were making a night march fell into the trap, and the whole army was destroyed, together with the generals Dorisis, Amorges, and Sisamachis. Merses too, the son of Gyges, was killed at the same time. The leader of the ambush was Heraclides, the son of Ibanolis, a man of Mylassa. Such was the way in which these Persians perished. 
In the meantime, Himaeus, who was likewise one of those by whom the Ionians were pursued after their attack on Sardis, directing his course towards the Propontis, took Chios, a city of Mysia. Learning, however, that Dorises had left the Hellespont and was gone into Caria, he in his turn quitted the Propontis and, marching with the army under his command to the Hellespont, reduced all the Aeolians of the Troad and likewise conquered the Gergithai a remnant of the ancient Teucrians. He didn't, however, quit the Troad, but after gaining these successes was himself carried off by disease. After his death, which happened as I have related, Artaphernes, the satrap of Sardis, and Otanes, the third general, were directed to undertake the conduct of the war against Ionia and the neighbouring Aeolis. By them, Cladzomene in the former and Chime in the latter were recovered. As the cities fell, one after another, Aristagoras, the Milesian, who was in truth, as he now plainly showed, a man of but little courage, notwithstanding that it was he who had caused the disturbances in Ionia and made so great a commotion, began, seeing his danger, to look about for means of escape. Being convinced that it was in vain to endeavour to overcome King Darius, he called his brothers in arms together and laid before them the following project. "'Twould be well, he said, to have some place of refuge in case they were driven out of Miletus. Should he go out at the head of a colony to Sardinia, or should he sail to Myrcinus in Edonia, which Histiaeus had received as a gift from King Darius and had begun to fortify? To this question of Aristagoras, Hecataeus the historian, son of Hegesander, made answer that in his judgment neither place was suitable. Aristagoras should build a fort, he said, in the island of Leros, and if driven from Miletus should go there and bide his time. From Leros attacks might readily be made, and he might re-establish himself in Miletus. Such was the advice given by Hecataeus. Aristagoras, however, was bent on retiring to Myrcinus. Accordingly, he put the government of Miletus into the hands of one of the chief citizens, named Pythagoras and taking with him all who liked to go, sailed to Thrace, and there made himself master of the place in question. From thence he proceeded to attack the Thracians, but here he was cut off with his whole army while besieging a city whose defenders were anxious to accept terms of surrender.